perfect place for you to be. And I hope that uh, you'll find that out before you leave here today. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Then you've got 1 and 2 Corinthians. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Last Sunday morning, the message was mostly directed toward unsaved people, even though that I hope that saved people got something out of it. By the way, Sunday morning messages are not the only messages. Sunday night messages are important. Wednesday night messages are important. Amen. I hope that you'll come to all three services. Amen. But this morning I want to bring a message that while it may seem uh, solemn and serious and much like last Sunday's message in the morning, this message is directed primarily at Christian people. And 2 Corinthians, go to chapter 5. When you find 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'd like to ask you to stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. Standing in reverence for the reading of the Word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin reading at verse 1, where the Bible says, For if we know, or for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. You ought to be confident. You ought to be confident you're going to heaven. We're not confident in the sense that we're self-confident, but we are confident. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Our text verse is verse 10. If you'd look at it one more time with me, where the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Would you bow your heads and hearts together with me, please, as we pray and then we'll bring the message as God allows on standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the song that you put in our hearts. Lord, I pray even before the message that you would use the Holy Ghost witness of the believers in this room as a testimony against anyone who is here who has never been saved, who does not have the song of the Lord in their hearts. I pray that that very absence that they have in their heart of the joy of the Lord, of the song of the Lord, might prepare them for trusting Jesus Christ as Savior, for receiving the rebuke of the Holy Spirit, the reproof of the Holy Spirit of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and realize that today they need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in Him and His atoning work, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, dear Father, please, by the Holy Spirit, apply the message upon the hearts of Christian people about the judgment seat of Christ for Your own glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Most people are in the dark 
concerning future judgment. The average person, when he thinks about judgment, believes in what we might call a general judgment at which all people stand before God, their works will be examined, and if their good works outweigh their bad works, then they think that they will get to heaven. The only problem with that is it's just not so. Yeah. It's just not so. Yeah. No one is going to get to heaven because their good works outweigh their bad works. That's right. If we were counting on our works to get us to heaven, we would all be left out. We would all be lost. You say, well, preacher, aren't we all working to get to the same place? No, sir. I'm not working to get anywhere. Yeah, amen. amen. Now I do have plans. I plan on after preaching to go eat lunch. And I do plan to get to heaven. I do plan to work until Jesus comes. Yeah. But I am not planning to get my way to heaven by my works. No, sir. A person who is saved is saved by God's grace yeah. through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. not of works, lest any man should boast. And actually, your eternal destiny is settled while you live, right. not in eternity. If you trust Christ as your Savior, you are saved. Amen. You don't have to wait until some final judgment to know whether you're saved or not. These things ever written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5, 13. You have eternal life from the moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. On the other hand, if you die without trusting Christ, you die as a lost person. Yep. And you are going to suffer eternal torment. <laughs> now I may come up with some kind of a fundraising scheme where I promise you that I'm going to pray you out of purgatory. The only problem with that is there's no such thing as purgatory. And if you're depending on my prayers to get you out of purgatory, you're in bad shape. Because it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And there are two judgments that will determine the degree of either eternal torment or eternal bliss. One of those I described last Sunday morning in a message called Standing Before God at the Great White Throne. The other judgment, and there are at least seven that I'll mention in just a moment, the other judgment that I want to talk to you about this morning is going to be covered in a message I'm going to call Standing Before the Judgment Seat of Christ. That's because of our verse here that says for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And there's another verse like it Romans 14 10 that says but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Dearly beloved this as well as last Sunday morning's message to me is a solemn truth. I have the joy of the Lord. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a happy Christian. Yeah. I enjoy God. I enjoy Glenwood Baptist Church. Amen. I enjoy nutty people that sit on the front row. I enjoy my wife. Nutty people that sit on the second row. <laughs> I enjoy our deacon. I enjoy the people who keep nursery. I enjoy the things of the Lord. I really do. But about the truths of the Bible, you're looking at a man as dead serious. Yeah. And about the great white throne judgment, it's no laughing matter. Yeah. And for you Christian people, about the judgment seat of Christ, it's no laughing matter. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried a 
about whether or not I'm going to heaven or hell. You can accuse me, you can abuse me. But I'm going to heaven. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. You say, oh, preacher, what if? All of the what ifs were covered at Calvary. Yeah. And it's not a confidence in me, it's a confidence, that, a confidence I have in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Woo. That's how I'm going. Amen. And if you're going, that's how you're going. Yeah. Now, we don't hear very much about judgment from pulpits today, but there are at least seven mentioned in the Bible. I have classified as judgments a judgment of Calvary, which has to do with salvation. That judgment was a judgment uh, on your sin and mine, on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you get to participate in that wonderful pardon when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a judgment of chastisement, which has to do with sonship. Every child of God has his sins judged practically in life as God chastens His children. You can believe that or not believe it, but it's true. As a matter of fact, if you don't experience that judgment, you are not saved. According to the book of Hebrews. Number three, there's a judgment of crowns which have to do with service. I'm not going to talk about those a whole lot uh, today, but that is uh, a judgment that is part of the judgment seat of Christ. There's a judgment I call the judgment of cattle, which has to do with separation of nations in, at the end of the tribulation period. Yep. There is a judgment in the Bible of condemnation, which has to do with sinners. And dearly beloved, we don't condemn lost people. They are condemned already because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There's a judgment of the church the Bible speaks of, which has to do with sanctification. And there's a judgment of the Christian, which has to do with the Scriptures. Additionally, there's a seven-year period of judgment called the Tribulation. If I had gotten with somebody to help me, I actually have a, a banner that we had designed, it's very simple, that I've never used. I had a design in my last church um, and uh, brought it here, and it would help perhaps in pointing some of this stuff out to you, but I forgot to, to prepare and do anything about it. But there's a coming period of judgment that, that many Bible students call the time of tribulation, and it's called in the Scripture the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the time of the church's trouble. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Our time of trouble is now. Our troubles will be over any minute. Yep. I'm not talking about me getting done preaching. You just don't <laughs> hold your breath about me saying for my last point. I'm talking about the rapture. Our, our troubles will be over. Until then, we're appointed under tribulation in this life. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, that's part of our Christian look. We're appointed to suffer with Jesus yeah. until He calls us home. Yeah. But there's a future appointment you and I have where we're going to be delivered from tribulation. We're appointed not to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Not salvation of the soul. That happened when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about salvation of the body. Listen up real quick. Maybe God will help you with this someday. But there are three tenses of salvation. Mm -hmm. If you're saved, it's because you have been saved from the penalty of sin. We Bible students tend to call that justification. Specifically, justification before God. If you're saved, you are being saved from the power of sin. Bible students tend to refer to that as sanctification, a progressive, practical sanctification. And if you're saved, you shall be saved one day from the very presence of sin. Amen. And uh, Bible students often refer to that as glorification. Oh, that will be glory for me. Amen. Praise God. One of these days, we're going to be changed. It's a translation and a transformation. 
By the way, that translation is the one I'm waiting for. Until then, I'm going to stick with my King James Bible. Amen. During the tribulation period, I call it a dispensation of judgment. All three classes of people, Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God, see 1 Corinthians 10, 32, will be judged. The Jews will be judged on earth under God's rod of correction, the man known as the Antichrist. Gentiles will be judged on the earth at the close of the tribulation in the valley of Jehoshaphat on the basis of their treatment of Jewish people during that time. The church will be judged in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ and that's what I'm trying to get to to talk to you about this morning. Christian, it does matter how you live after you're saved. I have never told people that they could get saved and live however they want to. Yeah. I don't preach that. Yeah, I do preach that how you live has nothing to do with you going to heaven. Mm -hmm. But you weren't saved just so you could go to heaven. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God saved you not only so that you might not perish but have eternal life, but God saved you to transform you. God saved you to make you a peculiar people. Amen. 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 You talk about me again? I said it's working. <laughs> You're pretty peculiar. Don't yeah. you laugh at me. <laughs> You're real peculiar too. Lonnie, don't you laugh. You're very peculiar. Amen. God wants us to be peculiar. He wants yeah. us to be different from this world. Yeah. He wants us to be different from what we would be if we just followed our flesh. Yeah. He wants us to be different from what we would be if we were just following sin. God saved you to work for Him. Amen. Yeah. You're not saved by your working for Him, but you are saved <coughs> to work for Him. Christian, it does matter how you live. Yeah. And Amen. I want to show you a verse before we give you four brief thoughts. <laughs> and that verse is verse 11. After telling Christian people who are confident that they're going to heaven, we're confident, are we? Yeah. We're confident that to uh, depart and be with Christ is far better. We're ready to go. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Any moment now, could happen, could be today. But in spite of the fact that we're confident, there's a judgment for Christians called the judgment seat of Christ. And after saying that we are going to appear there, the next verse, verse 11, the last verse we read, says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That word therefore refers to what you've been reading in verses 1 through 10. Amen. Yeah. You see the word therefore in a verse, you need to back up. Read the context to see what the word therefore is there for. <laughs> Aren't you glad you got a doctor for a preacher? <laughs> well, I'll give you four things. Number one, the requirement. The requirement of the judgment. Number two, the revelation at that judgment. Number three, the reception at that judgment. And number four, the rejoicing or regret at that judgment. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. First of all, look at verse 10, and I want to say something about the requirement of the judgment. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Dearly beloved, that's Christian people. When it says we in the context, if you go back to verse 1, it's talking about people that have a house in heaven. It's talking about people who are confident, people who are going to be with the Lord. It's Christian people, it's all Christian people, and it's only Christian people. Yep. Amen. Yep. Amen. Lost people are going to face the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Saved people are going to face the judgment seat of Christ. They're two different judgments. Now, this appearance is a must. You're going... Just like I said, lost people are going to show up at the great white throne judgment. There's nothing you can do about it. Saved people are going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is a judgment to examine your service to God. And if that doesn't stir you up, it should. Amen. Because even though our service 
has nothing to do with whether or not we go to heaven, it still should stir you up yeah. to think about that whether or not you come to church tonight is something you're going to answer for before God at the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Whether or not you put your tithe check in the offering plate, see, I'm, I'm not under that burden about you doing it. That's between you and God. you got to face God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not worried about it a bit. God will take care. I'll preach the truth. God will take care. But you and I, we've got to appear before God. And what's your excuse going to be then? Oh, Lord, you just don't understand my financial situation. You're going to say that to God? <laughs> You're going to say to God, you don't understand, I can't tithe? Yeah. Are you going to say to God, you don't understand uh, my budget? If you could look at my budget, Lord. Yeah. What kind of God do you serve? Yeah. I'm talking about, it's something to think about the terror of the Lord, the requirement. The accountability is a must. See, you don't have to give account to me. But you do have to give an account to God. Yeah. Romans 14, 12 says, So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Yeah. That's in the context of the other verse where it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, 10. And then the authority, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a must. I'm telling you, you're not going to avoid an encounter with Jesus Christ, your Savior, to give an account for your service someday. I listen to you folks' as excuses for things, and I do my best to not uh, be mean to you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I hear them every day. Why you don't, and why you won't, and why you ain't. <laughs> I hear them all the time. <clears throat> you don't need to worry about me. I'm just a South Georgia boy. I, I wouldn't be doing this if God didn't call me to do it. I got no desire to dominate your faith. God can't make me a blessing. I won't be here. But you're going to give an account to God one day Amen. why you're so backslid. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, preacher, you talking about me? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. If you got to ask, you got it, buddy. You're exactly the one I'm talking to. Don't you stick your tongue out at me. I saw that. <laughs> I don't know. I just pray the Holy Spirit will make it personal. Yeah. But you can't avoid it. You're going to see Jesus someday if you're saved. Yeah. And, and you're going to look at the wounds in His hands mm -hmm. and the wounds in His feet. You're going to explain why you can't do what you're supposed to be doing. You're going to explain to him. Look at the Savior who died for you. And explain to him why you couldn't figure out how to rearrange your schedule. Mm -hmm. Rearrange your finances. Rearrange your priorities. To where you could do what God wants you to do. It's a requirement. There'll be no avoiding. Yeah, something good is going to happen to you. <laughs> Something bad is going to happen as well if you're not prepared. I'm not saying you're going to hell. But I'm saying, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Number two, I said I want to talk to you about the revelation at that judgment. There's a passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that will not get you to try to follow along with me, but it seems to describe what might happen at the judgment seat of Christ because it talks about how that there's coming a day when all of our works are going to be made manifest. To be made manifest means to show up and appear and be obvious to everybody. And the Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If you're saved, the foundation is laid. Yeah. Then you build on the foundation. Yeah. And the Bible says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Beloved, this has nothing to do with whether or not you're saved. Eternal life is not a reward. But this has to do with rewards. What we're talking about is the difference between salvation, which is a gift, and service, which brings rewards. You understand that? Yes. Everybody got that? Right. Salvation is by grace through faith. Service is you living by faith and working out that which God is working in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is not a reward. Okay? It's a gift. If you got it, you got it. If you got it, you didn't deserve it. If you got it, you didn't earn it. You got it because God loved you and offered it to you and you took it. Woo! Amen. That's how simple it is. A little child can get that. But if you're saved, you're supposed to live for God. That's what we call service. And at the judgment seat of Christ, your service is going to be examined by fire. And if your service, like an unto building materials, if you're building a house, if your service abides through the fire, like the gold, silver, precious stones, then the Bible says you will get a reward. If it doesn't, and it burns up like the wood, hay, and stubble, then you'll suffer loss. You'll be saved, but you'll suffer loss. Gone up and smoke any reward. At the judgment, our faithfulness to God is going to be revealed. People who know you really good know whether you're faithful or not. Mm -hmm. right. But God knows better than that. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes you can even fool the people who know you pretty well. Yeah. Right. You don't fool as many people as you think you do. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. After a while, people get to know us for what we are. Mm -hmm. But God knows you better than your spouse knows you. God knows you better than your mom and dad knows you. God knows you better than your children. God knows you better than you know yourself. And our faithfulness is going to be revealed. Our fruitfulness is going to be revealed. Our falsehoods are going to be revealed. And they'll be exposed as God exposes the fact that in some cases we were mostly taught and little action. God's going to expose our feeble excuses for disobeying Christ. And all the different things that we can mention. And then verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 5 will mention our reception at that judgment. And what I mean by that is that verse says we're going to receive some things. And what it has to do with, it has to do with we're going to get the consequences of our works in the future. It has nothing to do with whether or not you go to heaven or hell. It has to do with what's going to happen with you on this earth when Jesus Christ rules this earth for a thousand years. You and I, if you're saved, are going to rule with Jesus Christ someday. We're going to reign, according to Revelation 5.10, we shall reign on the earth. But not everybody's going to be in a ruling situation. Some people are going to be on the earth, they won't be ruling anything. They're going to lose their inheritance, lose their reward. Not eternal life. Not going to lose that. But the Bible says, for we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he has done, whether it be good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Salvation is a gift you receive in life by trusting Jesus Christ. This is talking about something you're going to receive in the future and it has to do with rewards or loss of rewards. I will quickly mention that these are listed in the Bible as crowns. First of all, there's a crown I call the crown of suffering. Mentioned in James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10 as the crown of life given to Christians who are faithful in suffering. We've got people who come to this church and they come to this church in spite of the fact they're hurting. We've got people that go on visitation who go on visitation in spite of the fact that they're hurting. We've got people in this church, and I'm saying these things by faith because I don't know about everything. I don't know how bad you hurt. 
But we've got people in this church who give tithes and give above their tithes and they do it faithfully even though that they're having problems paying their bills at home. I'm talking about we've got some people who are faithful to God in suffering. God pays attention to it and He's going to give you a crown. Amen. Then there's the crown of a shepherd spoken of in 1 Peter 5, 1-4 as a crown of glory given to a pastor who faithfully leads and feeds God's flock. There's a crown that I call a crown of soul winning. The Bible calls it a crown of rejoicing. And I've got verses for all these but I'm trying to move on. And this is given to a faithful soul winner based on his labor, not results. The Bible says, Every man concerning soul winning shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And then there's the crown of the second coming. Anybody can get that crown because this crown called the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 4 is given to anybody who loves the Lord's appearing. Amen. Amen. And the love that you have for the Lord's appearing is evidenced in that passage by a good fight, a finished course, and a kept faith. I don't know if you remember those things that Paul said. He said, he said the time of my departure is in. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then he said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give not only me, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Then there's another crown called the crown of self-control. At least that's what I call it. It's called in the Bible an incorruptible crown given to a believer who keeps his body in subjection to God's Spirit. And he follows the leadership of the Holy Spirit instead of the leadership of his own flesh. And all of these crowns have to do with ruling with Jesus Christ in the coming millennial kingdom. Jesus is going to rule this world someday. Amen. 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 Every president I've ever voted for, if he got into office, would do things I don't like. <laughs> and he would do things God don't like. And I don't care what party they're with or who they are. As a matter of fact, if you got elected, you would disappoint somebody. Yeah. Probably me. Yeah. I might not even vote for you. <laughs> if you got elected, you would, but one of these days, Jesus is going to rule the earth. Yeah. Exactly as it should be. With verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5 in mind, I want to close by mentioning the rejoicing or the regret at the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. In Philippians 2.16, Paul said, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Then I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Dearly beloved, whether or not the judgment seat of Christ turns out to be a sweet experience or a sorrowful experience is up to you. If you're saved, living for Jesus is a choice. Joshua said back in the Old Testament, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Say, preacher, I just can't be as dedicated as you want me to be. Let me give you a little ease of mind. Don't worry about how much I want you to live for Jesus. Does that make it easier for you? Don't worry. I'm not. I try to persuade you to live for Jesus, but I don't take it personal. I've been lied to so many times, if I took it personal, I'd be mad. <laughs> I've been lied to this week. Yeah. And if I took it personal, I'd be mad. I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm about done. What you do with the message is up to you. I'm about done. I'm going to lunch. This day's going good. <laughs> but you can make the choice. Joshua says, choose you this day. Tonight, you can make a choice. Offering plate comes by, you make a choice. Invitation is given at the close of the sermon. It's up to you. Just make a choice. And you just either choose to do what God wants you to do, or you choose to do something else. 
I'd like to encourage you. If you want to have no regrets at the judgment seat of Christ, do what God would have you to do. Amen. So that if you show up at church, like this fellow did, showed up on Saturday, first time that he joined the church, first Saturday, shows up, I could say to him, Dallas, what are you doing here? You're a new member. I didn't even invite you to go on this day. He could say, I thought the Lord would have me to be here. Amen. And I'm trying to please Him. Amen. He didn't say that. He said He was there because preacher wanted I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you could say, yeah. I'm here. You ought to say you're a member of this church because the Lord wants you here. Yeah. You give because the Lord wants you to do it. You witness because the Lord wants you to do it. Yeah. You have habits you've tried to quit. You've got habits you've tried to start. Not for the preacher, but because you believe the Lord. Amen. Wants you to do it. Amen. Jesus died for you. That ought to be enough. Amen. But as an added incentive, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Let's stand together, heads bowed. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a moment, the music is going to play.